I'm pleased to introduce uh, Marav Shohet, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at Boston University. She works at the intersection of cultural, medical, and linguistic anthropology, and has been publishing at a rapid clip in all the top journals in anthropology, including American Anthropologist, American Ethnologist, the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, and many more prestigious journals. She's been even writing about eating disorders in North America, although today it's her work on Vietnam, uh, which we'll be listening to um, in her presentation. <clears throat> the Vietnam work, uh, which I'm quite familiar with, is truly pathbreaking. She's not only interested in care and intersubjective relationships as a topic of study, but her work is notable for the care and sensitivity she brings into her ethnography. She engages ethnographically with Vietnamese concepts like sacrifice, hy sinh, and sentiment or love, tin cam. But in the process, her own work appears as a kind of affect-laden, careful offering. And I mean that word careful, not only in the sense of being meticulous, but as being an act of care itself. That is, her work is full of care and compassion, as well as rigorous linguistic analysis of person referencing and everyday greetings. And it's not too often that you see care and compassion in rigorous linguistic anthropological analysis. So it's a true, truly remarkable achievement. Um, in the subtle but beautifully rendered stories and episodes relayed by Marab's work, we see how the most mundane everyday acts are imbued with the stuff that makes people into people and how everyday Vietnamese engage in the literal work of coming into being as intersubjectively entangled humans. That beautifully evocative phrase in Vietnamese, làm người, to make a person. Um, I'll stop here and uh, please join me in welcoming Marav for today's talk, which will be a discussion of her brand new book, Silence and Sacrifice, Family Stories of Care and the Limits of Love in Vietnam, which is just out now from the University of California Press. Um, so please join me in welcoming Marav. Um, gosh, Thank you all. I, th I think I should let Eric um, actually present about my book. I'm, I'm so honored to, to have you all um, here and, and to share a bit about my book today. I'm going to try to screen share right now. Great. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for being here and Eric for inviting me and giving me this opportunity and Chris for arranging it. Um, and I'll just launch right in. Um, to talk a bit about silence and sacrifice, family stories of care and the limits of love in Vietnam. Um, and I know that we're all pretty zoomed out probably, um, it being April and a year into the pandemic. So I'll try to keep it not too long, um, but do feel free to interrupt me at any time, um, especially in the first part um, when I'm just talking about some of the um, concepts of the book and then I'll move on to, um, to give a few excerpts from chapter chapter four of this book. And the book is really organized um, in three parts with the introduction, um, setting up the scene, the concepts, and then breaking down the, the three basic principles that I see as organizing and structuring life um, and especially kind of life experience and ethical subjectivity of my interlocutors in Vietnam. And that's um, sacrifice, asymmetrical reciprocity and then cam that I'll be talking about. Um, and then the second part of the book emphasizes a lot more the complications on the ground, especially as people in Da Nang and Wang Nam um, um, who had more tenuous connections to the state um, and had kind of ghosts haunting them at times from the past. Um, so, so looking at how these principles play out in practice when we study them in situ. Um, the research obviously was in Vietnam, specifically in Da Nang and Wang Nam. Um, 
And I conducted the field work a while ago in 2002 until 2008. Um, and then it took me quite a number of years to process all of the data and make sense of it. So I spent a total of about 18 months in the field with 13 consecutive ones um, in 2007-8. Um, and I studied families. And so I did a lot of household surveys kind of looking at family composition and um, routines and that kind of thing. And that was about 80, 80 households. And then among those or including those, I studied five focal families who were, um, they're all extended families. They were multi-generational, multi-household. 60% of them lived in multi-generational units. Um, most of them were middle class. Um, and this relied on participant observation, on interviews, on person-centered interviews, except um, what I came to see it as because I was looking at multiple members within a family instead of just individuals, I, I came to see it as a family-centered ethnography, which I think enriches the, the notion from psychological anthropology of person-centered, where you look at people not just as tokens of a type, but really as, um, as individuals in their own rights. Um, I also did a number of recordings. I went to each family about every four to six weeks and um, in total had 95, uh, 94 hours of recordings. Um, which, you know, obviously with their permission, and I had thousands of photographs and notes and all that. Um, so I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to transcribe everything, but I did a lot of it with, um, with the assistance of local assistants and then also native speakers in the US and Canada. Um, and so I didn't originally mean to study silence and sacrifice per se, um, but really what I was interested in is what holds families together in the face of change. And that was because in Da Nang, where the Americans had landed during the war and were situated, all of the families I studied had been torn. Um, they had some members who had gone north to fight for North Vietnam and some who had stayed, some affiliated with the South, with the, um, with the Americans, some affiliated with the Viet Cong, some affiliated at times with both. And so I was wondering, um, you know, having come a good 30 years later, how is it that families are, seem so able to to, to eat together and celebrate together and work together and enjoy each other's company. Um, and I found that um, there are several key components that help in this. One of them is hasten or sacrifice, which I came to think of as really willingly, silently, and smilingly embracing hardship for the benefit of asymmetrically positioned others. Vietnam is full of hierarchies, a lot of it organized around kinship and the GAM, which, um, so sacrifice, he said, I constantly read about it and sometimes heard about it in learning Vietnamese. And the GAM is something that I always heard in daily life as families talk about it. And so I really wanted to understand this, these very basic concepts, like what, what do they mean? How do they work? Um, how do they help create this sense of continuity? Um, and, and I came to think of them as really working together to also reinforce um, and gender norms and also age and class and political divisions. Um, and so in, in thinking about this, um, I was really also interested in the anthropology of ethics and morality and how it is that people enact ethics. Um, what does it mean to be a virtuous person in a time of upheaval and change and rifts and ruptures? And I saw the beginning of the 21st century as yet another moment of change as Vietnam was continuing with the uh, Dai Mai uh, market economy where nationalized forms of care were increasingly absent. And I ended up concluding that um, despite this ethic that preaches that people should be um, 
beneficent to each other, should respect above and yield below. This is what I call asymmetrical reciprocity. Women, especially young and poor ones, and especially in Da Nang, those who had sided with the losing side of the American war, shoulder a disproportionate burden. Um, and this is in part because of the market forces that reinforced the gender and cultural norms that saddled them with a work of care, with putting on the feasts, with um, navigating the new economy. Um, and so, as I said, a lot of this has to do with the gam and he said sacrifice. Um, and this is really not um, gendered in the ways that maybe we think of in American or European terms as sacrifice being the domain of men to, to give their lives up in war and think am love and care as the domain of women. Everybody participates in it um, in, in this logic, but not always in uniform ways. Um, and in studying this, I'm really drawing and expanding on certain anthropological concepts. The, our approach to sacrifice has been largely to think of it in the dramatic terms as a religious ritual, um, as um, you know, the act of slaughter or substitution, and relatedly as a uh, patriotic act. And both of these are highly dramatic, a kind of spectacle with bloodshed. And I think what we have ignored is the really the everyday acts of sacrifice in mundane life um, that sometimes I've even gotten pushback when presenting and saying, well, he said isn't really sacrifice. And, and in fact, um, in Vietnam, it's very much associated with patriotic sacrifice, um, but also with a family and with a feminized work of care. Um, it's not traditionally associated with slaughter. There's other terms for that. Um, and so in looking at the, the mundane, I'm, I'm looking at sacrifice in the beginning of the book as really kind of scaling these multiple levels of both the affiliation with the state. And in chapter one, I talk about a, um, a man from Wang Nam, who I call Then, um, who had tried to evade um, conscription into the French um, army in the 1950s, was captured, was tortured. And then in 1954, when Vietnam was split, um, he was released in a prisoner exchange. He went up north and um, then spent a good chunk of his life um, away from his natal family and um, and, and then also away from his wife, who he married in the North, um, because he went back um, with a call of duty to liberate the South. Um, and he talks a lot about sacrifice and he talks about, you know, kind of the propaganda of Vietnam is, is one, um, nothing is more precious than liberty and, and so forth. Um, but what he also talks about is suffering. And one of the things I learned from him and from many others is the ways that suffering is really supposed to be silent. You don't call attention to yourself um, when taking it on for somebody else. And the ways that men as well as women oftentimes attribute sacrifice to women, especially to mothers. This is kind of the, the paragon of virtue. It is, is the sacrificing mother um, who tends to her children, to her husband, to the nation, to the community. Um, and, and so this, this kind of guided my understanding also of the second principle, which is asymmetrical reciprocity, um, and then thirdly, Pencam, and, and the ways that these work together um, to organize people's experiences of time and um, of their relationships with, um, with the two calendars, for example, in Vietnam, with the ancestors, with each other, with the state. Um, and then in chapter three, I show among other things, how um, state discourses um, and attempts to legislate equality are really an effect um, engendering difference um, and, and the ways that silence figures in all of these um, in naturalizing gender and other hierarchies. And these are premised, of course, on this presumption of the unequal but benevolent and bi-directional care. And so oftentimes when we think of Vietnam's legacy 
um, as Confucian and as Buddhist, thinking about filial piety, and some people have written about it in terms of a kind of exploitation from above, the power from above demanding respect. In fact, I think that it's, it's more useful to think of hierarchy as bidirectional in the ideal case. But of course, as, as I noted earlier, this also doesn't always play out in practice. There are those who suffer more and suffer more in silence. Um, and so then the second half of the book um, is troubling some of these principles um, of ethics and morality of sacrifice and asymmetrical reciprocity. Um, when, when I studied them in practice, looking at families, um, I think as we need to, if we want to understand kinship and relations within a community, um, we really need to, to look at the multiple people with their different and cross-cutting and dynamic and, and really um, intersectional perspectives and grievances. And so I want to turn now to chapter four to give a sense of this um, with some experts from that chapter. Um, and just before I do that, I want to introduce three other concepts that will help us um, make sense of these that I borrow from literary studies. And that really are, those are the concepts of foreshadowing, backshadowing, and sideshadowing narratives. Um, that I use in, in um, making sense of people's experiences and narrations and interactions. So I'm sure we're all familiar with foreshadowing. Um, it's, um, it's where we see past events as foretelling future ones. So for example, if we start something with, it was a dark and stormy night, we know that this cliche is going to lead to some um, issues and problems as is the case in any narrative. And this is often associated with um, narratives of progress and modernity. So in the US, the kind of ideology of manifest destiny of Americans to move West and conquer and display place, Native American peoples. And in Vietnam too, when we think of it as having um, the civilization begin in the Red River Delta and moving southward and uh, displacing other ethnic minorities and uh, forming its own heroic civilization. And backshadowing uses the same sort of logic, but in reverse in that we know already what happened and then we judge the past in terms of that knowledge of the present, the future, right? Um, and so both the foreshadowing and backshadowing tend to have these linear um, <clears throat> narratives with a clear beginning, middle, and end um, that kind of direct events with a, a constant moral stance. And this is something that we do all the time in life. And we oftentimes associate narrative with these kinds of stories that come ready-made. But of course, in life itself, when we don't know what will happen next. And when we often ruminate on what might have been, what steps we might have taken, there is also the practice of side shadowing. And that is really to um, think about contingency and, um, and contradiction, which we constantly encounter in life when we feel ambivalence, when, when things are not so linear, when things are not so certain, when, when there is doubt. Um, and incommensurability. And so I use these frameworks to make sense of how people live the everyday and the ritual lives and how they make sense of, um, of their life. And um, in 21st century Danang, when I was there, one of the, uh, two of the things that really concerned people um, were of course health and wealth. And um, those are things that are sometimes precarious to, um, to, to have, especially in a marketizing economy, um, although really in, in any economy. And, and what I saw is that even though people were not exactly eager to talk about the past most of the time, there was really a kind of ideology of let's move beyond and let's not think about the painful past. At the same time, there was a kind of um, long shadow um, cast by war um, when people's loyalties had been split and um, also concurrently the uncertainty about the future um, during that present transition to market socialism under Doi Mai. 
And so um, one of the things I want to argue is that there is really no such thing as privatization, which Doi Mai is, is oftentimes uh, in neoliberalism is, um, is associated with um, by looking and using the, the tools of linguistic anthropology to, to highlight the micro instances of care. Um, and here I focus on the moral rather than the political ecology of market socialist Vietnam and illustrate some of the ambivalences and complexities of care. And, and here I begin with two premises. One is that in focusing on individuals who care, I assume not the rightfully maligned um, autonomous, bounded, self-interested persons that theorists usually attribute to Western or even neoliberal subjects, but instead um, I'm thinking of persons as relational, as evaluative subjects, um, whose ethics they come into relief when we attend to the living narratives of everyday interaction. And here again, what I mean by narrative is not a contained text, but rather how people talk with one another and interact one another to, um, to make sense and to lay moral claims against one another. Um, as these unfold in time and in interaction. And um, what I'll show is that people and family caregivers attempts to provide care is really fraught with moral peril and filled with ambivalent silences that threaten to unravel the relations in late reform Vietnam. And so any harmony or continuity or kind of sense of the ordinary that, that we might um, think of, then these are not ready-made. These are effortfully achieved and they're precariously sustained. And my second assumption is that in cases of end-of-life care, um, we need competence. People need caregivers they, they're constantly um, striving in an effort to keep the dying alive and comfortable. Um, and yet this competence or incompetence is at once imminent, it's impending since we can become in, incompetent or competent at any time, um, but it's also imminent, it's inherent in any social interaction and, and that's why it's also fluid. Um, and throughout field work, what, what I sought to understand is, is um, how it is that, that people, um, what it means to be a competent ethical person in Da Nang. And I've already published on this and it also figures in chapter two, the ways that children learn politeness routines to acknowledge their elders. And that this is actually an incipient form of subjectivation into the morality, into the disposition of sacrifice that has a lot to do with um, ancestor worship later in life and, and ways of taking on suffering in silence, um, disciplining the body, withholding from, my, from, from yourself. Um, and these acts are never private, they're never unitary. They involve a range of asymmetrical forms of reciprocity and they reinforce hierarchies. And so here I focus on one such instance um, and the stories that, surrounding, that surround it um, in not in a case of childcare, but really in a case of older care, um, where unlike in America, where oftentimes we think of the end of life as highly biomedicalized, and this of course exists, people do go to the hospital, the person I talk about did go to the hospital, but ultimately a lot of the care is done at home um, by kin who have to um, also continue their daily lives, their worship activities, their income earning activities and all that. And so I focus here on a 75 year old woman who I call Babai. Um, and she started complaining to me quietly back in April of headaches. And then she suffered a minor stroke in July and then spent weeks in the hospital and finally returned home and went right back to the squatting of food preparation and, and cleaning and taking care of her granddaughters. And she suffered another stroke. And this time she went into a permanent vegetative state and the family was essentially waiting for her to die. Um, and, um, but they didn't know when she might die. 
and they shrouded this calamity in silence. So Baz's husband, um, he coped by sleeping a lot and um, saying very little. And the family's women were the ones who really stepped in to fill the vacuum and um, manage the loss with material acts of caregiving. caregiving. And so again, she spent several months in the hospital um, hooked up to machines. And then in the end, in the face of mounting costs, she returned home in December. And so she lay in the bed, placed in the living room, tended by her daughters and daughters-in-law. Um, and what I want to focus here right now is on just a minute of interaction, and I'll just show maybe half a minute of it, um, that, of uh, footage that I filmed in January, about a month after she had come back home. And, you know, one of my methodologies was filming regularly in the family homes, and I admit I was reluctant. To, to film a um, sick and dying woman, but here she was in the living room. Um, the corner is where the TV used to be. And the family was like, well, why aren't you filming this? Why aren't you taking pictures? So I did. And um, so what, what we see here, uh, or we are going to see is a little drama unfold that illustrates how the kin display care for the dying and apprentice ethical personhood. And this emergent socialization routine begins with Bear lying in bed in the living room, her knees locked upright. Her daughter-in-law, Lan, pleads with a comatose elder to straighten these out. Um, who has come to watch uses the non-deferential second personal pronoun me, which only status seniors use towards status juniors to establish hierarchy as he calls out to Lan until she looks up to him and only to tell her straighten out his wife's legs. Um, so I'll play this while talking and, and then I'll play it again. So with a smile, Lan answers in a plaintive voice. She keeps grimacing. She then adds, this morning I was able to stretch her a bit, but she's really struggling. Doesn't matter, um, reassures, but Lan continues with her complaint. Actually, she's mad at me. I'm hurting her terribly. Approaching the bed, um, mutters, Dow, it hurts. And then he gazes at his wife as Lan continues to walk on Baz's legs. Bending over to clearly address that, this is what we see now, um, states in an authoritative paternalistic voice, doesn't hurt. Bending even closer, he exhorts that in a scolding voice, endure the pain, stretch out the legs, why stay cramped up? His eyes then focusing on that, he adds in a gentler, quieter voice, raising and lowering his chin in a kind of entreaty, stretch out, stretch out. Throughout, Lan continues to gently press on her mother-in-law's legs, working to make Ba cooperate with Om's directive. She overlaps with him, protesting quietly, I tried doing that, while Om's sister-in-law adds her own command, stretch out the legs, let her legs lie on the bed. And I can um, just do this again. You all hear me okay? Uh, my computer is kind of... So adopting Goffman's model of participant roles, we see how the two generations organize the interaction in gendered and age-graded ways. It's the daughter-in-law, Lan, who physically takes care of the ill woman, Ba, while the seniors direct her to keep doing what she has, in fact, been attempting to do. Lan, in turn, has little recourse than to smile, comply, and only weakly protest that she has been doing, as told. We learn even more about responsibility, morality, and power if we consider the ecology of this micro-interaction. This includes participants' eye gaze, movements, and bodily use of space, which reveal who is interpolated as a ratified participant and how. From this perspective, the exchange looks less harsh. It exemplifies acts of care. 
Despite Bear's grave condition, her incompetent caregivers treat her as a ratified participant. She's someone to whom they attribute a will, emotions, and agency. Um, scolds, land pleads, and imagines or experiences being scolded, and in contrast with those who are not there daily to attend Bear, they at times address her directly, not just as a mostly but not yet dead body. In Schutz's sense, they enact a we relationship with Bear. They treat her not as a soon-to-be predecessor, someone who shares neither the same temporal nor spatial frame with them, but as a consociate, someone with whom they could still grow older together. And this often happens that people treat each other as consociates when they're ancestors and directly addressing them, praying to them and feeding them. They know that Ba cannot respond either verbally or with her body, yet Am and Lan read her knotted brow and stiff limbs as expressions of pain and stubborn reproof. They treat her, in other words, as still endowed with a rich cognitive life, even though she is motionless, essentially unresponsive, and on the verge of death. They care. In this incipient narrative, Am's exhortations to stretch out models for Lan how to act in a difficult and morally fraught instance where the daughter-in-law is afraid to hurt and earn the wrath of her mother-in-law. In addressing Ba, Am indirectly exhorts Lan to keep on tending to the old woman, not to allow Ba's limbs to stiffen and suffer even more. This is an interpersonal form of care that does not explicitly implicate the market. But though privately done at home in passing, it is a public act that demands recognition and repetition. And yet Lan and Am were not professional end-of-life care givers. They struggle to make Ba comfortable and to manage their own discomfort. Most days, they did so in muted ways. Land smiling and I'm sleeping in the face of Baz's calamity. In the absence of prescribed rituals, which are in place for tending and honoring the dead, they worked instead at treating with respect and care this matriarch who for so long had herself managed the smooth running of the household. They implicated, they interpolated not just each other, but also the comatose there. Um, as capable of moral action, as imminently competent and yet, and yet imminently incompetent beings who are engaged in an ethical project for care, of care for and about one another. And this is why the interaction seems so fraught, I think. We see unequally positioned family members deliberate through fleeting actions over what the best good in Cheryl Mattingly's terms is for the nearly dead. They seem to act in unison, in agreement that even though stretching out Baz's legs causes the inert but recalcitrant body and the person inhabiting it pain, because she's still a living person, and they have to enjoin Ba to endure the pain to Chiu and to act ethically in this world. And yet this version of care and ethical personhood was precarious. Performed daily in Baz's house till her eventual death um, the following spring, it enlisted a range of Baz relatives who visited periodically and spoke to and about her. As they continued to participate in the household's rituals, no one projected Ba into the future as an ancestor and no one mentioned her imminent death. They oriented her only as a present and suffering and suffering somewhat indignantly. I could end by concluding that these occasions, like Baz's earlier quiet endurance of pain, where for months she did not seek care for her high blood pressure, reflect local understandings of gendered virtuous care and daily sacrifice, demanded by an economy of retracting state care. But the story doesn't end here. Um, not everyone regarded Amon Ba as innocent victims. Amon Ba's niece, Anne, for example, surprised me one December day with a story of past wrongs and transgressions. I briefly recount this story and the imminent critique that Ba's current state led Anne to project, both to show how protagonists are not all equally burdened with the ethical work of enduring suffering for the sake of another silently, and also to show how fragile love and care can be under both marketization and socialism and under war. Decades earlier, Am's brothers fought on opposing sides of the American war. 
and yet the siblings always deemed, um, seemed tight-knit. They kept past divisions mute. They liked to recount how Am had done right by his youngest brother, Sin, raising him and ensuring his education since their father died young in 1948. These were compact, coherent, striving narratives with clear beginnings and morally predictable endings. But here, um, but there is another side-shattering genre of narratives. These stories highlight ambiguity, ambivalence, and contradiction. Co-narrated and non-linear, they invite moral reflection and debate. In Anne's meandering story, Am and his wife appear as withholding or suspending care during and after the war. Anne narrates this tale of wrongs indirectly. It's a side-shattering story told non-linearly by weaving back and forth through time, emphasizing moments of connection, love, and hurt. Am and Ba had not risked losing their house for, for sheltering their American collaborating brother, Sin, nor had they helped his faithful wife, Ma, visit him in communist re-education camp like Am's sister and Anne's mother, B had done. Am and Ba's passive acts of omission of care which remained implicit and unnarrated, also turned into sinful commission when Am um, sold off lands that jointly belonged to all his siblings, and he left Sin's children nothing. The threads of this story are tangled, narrating shifting affective stances, oblique connections, and, dis and disagreements that are not resolved. And these, these are all um, worked out in, in chapter four. Um, in side-shattering fashion, Anne presents a series of contested moral stances as protagonists hold conflicting commitments to their kin. She grieves for the now deceased Ma, um, who, um, who died after the couple left Vietnam. But when Anne was upset at Sin for remarrying, her mother B defended him and scolded Anne. Blood ties trump friendship. Anne's story continually descends into the past and navigates a present seemingly blindly without full clarity of hindsight. It relies on silences and absences, not saying that Am had not cared for his brother, but pointing out how his sister had. She tells me, siblings love, they take care of each other. They don't care about whatever happens. They don't care about money. And yet Anne's story is filled with instances in which gifts of money stood for acts of love and refusal to give was equated with betrayal. Contradiction pervades her stories and still one point emerges clearly at the end when Anne's mother, B takes over the telling. Land prices soared, but Am and his wife barely shared profits from the sale of their gran grandparents' land and refused her, her even the smallest of loans. They didn't care. Here, B and Anne use backshadowing, using the present hindsight to morally assess past deeds, to link Ba's present state to recent and past wrongs. Their story, which gained steam only slowly, suddenly crescendoed to its conclusion. The present suffering was karmic retribution for a life that could have been led otherwise. Her voice quietly furious, B says, I only asked, I asked for so little, they wouldn't give it. This was recent, before Babai got sick. Am um, said he didn't have it, fuck. We yield to him whatever he wants. Mother and daughter abruptly stopped the account with B's unexpected curse. Resentments over care withheld or inadequately performed, which could lie dormant for decades, came to the surface with Ba's present illness. This occasioned imminent reflection over how to care and imminent judgment about who is competent or incompetent at doing so. Tensions subtly expressed in instances such as when Baz's legs need to be straightened incite caregivers to reflect on who has cared and who deserves caring. A linguistic phenomenological lens reveals how temporal horizons reach into the past and future, both in Anne and B's backshadowing and sideshadowing stories that frame the past expectations and promises unfulfilled as foregone conclusions or as unexpected turns. In Lan and Am's incipient and acted narratives, ethical figures take shape through complaints, exhortations, and silences. These stories and silences color present concerns over care, condense in Baz's figure 
lying on her bed in the living room, unconscious and unrestful. These not only sustain, but also threaten to rupture shared understandings of who is or was virtuous and why, forcing and forging an ethics of cool, not of cool judgment, but rife with cascading affects of love and regret. And so, and so here I'm talking about the ways that ethics isn't really about this rational withdrawing and thinking about how to act. It's also filled with, with emotion in trying, to, in trying to behave morally. And yet still, rupture was kept at bay. Anne and B continued to visit Bath, effectively refusing to jeopardize rituals of care and dominant narratives of virtue, despite some tensions. Their stories, where scornful language erupts, remained almost exclusively silenced. I conclude then that by tracing the unfolding implotments and intersections of Am, Anne's, and B's stories, we can witness how precarious the work of enduring in the name of love and care is and how quotidian sacrifices remain for the most part, silenced in speech, but demonstrated in action. Competence and incompetence are simultaneously imminent and imminent in social life, bringing into relief the moral economy and politics of care at home, where market constraints form a mostly silenced but not invisible template for what actions seem possible and desirable. Here, privatization is not an option, Life is social and fraught to the core. In the rest of the book, I continue to show how participants navigate these sorts of dilemmas and conflicts, sometimes choosing silence, other times gossip, to make claims of one another in an ethically fraught relational world. Again and again, we can discern the cultural patterns through attention to the minutia of language and interaction, which color and even constitute the ways in which families and communities struggle to cohere. And these reveal yet again the old feminist insight that public ethics are to be found in the after all not so private domain of families, um, families always already political home lives. In the conclusion of the book, Mourning and Silent Sacrifice, I revisit a piece I wrote for American ethnologists on the death and funeral preparations in another family, where we see how the bereaved attempt to contain their grief. Here too, I argue that repetition, like change, doesn't always beget futurity or natality in Hannah Arendt's terms, even in Vietnamese, where he sin signals life and suffering in silence for the sake of love. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to stop the share to open it up to discussion. Any questions? Thank you, Marav. Um, so everyone, we have uh, well well beyond the hour um, to uh, engage in question and answer. Um, you can raise your hand using the hand raise function or send a note to the chat and I'll keep a running list and then allow Marav to answer the questions as they come. So. Um, uh, Oscar, did I see your hand go up? Go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. It's a fascinating story that you told. Uh, and really, I like the meticulous narration of all the activities, um, you know, the stories, but then also the actions, um, the silencing as well. And um, so it reminds me a bit of how to put this. Um, there was once this uh, maybe medieval European or Renaissance European uh, philosopher, uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam. One of the things that he wrote was etiquette books, how to behave. And if you would read these etiquette books now, it's about don't spit on the floor, don't relieve yourself in the corner. Uh, so now, these things would probably not be necessary uh, in most places to remind people of. And the reason why he brought it down, he was not the only one, or it was like a genre at the time. Uh, um, so on the one hand, there's an emphasis about doing something or not doing something. There's a reality which is a bit different. And, your story really reminded me, uh, reminded me of that. Um, how yep. what people say might 
be completely different from realities or mask uh, their realities. And you start out your story with uh, uh, and I think everybody who's been a foreigner, I should say, been to Vietnam, has heard that, you know, to go away, you can, you know, you hear, you hear that like a million times, right? Um, but I'm wondering, could you have to reflect on that? Because I have the deep suspicion that that expression of the can masks very often a lack of it um, in interpersonal relationships. But I'd like to hear your reflections about that. Yeah, um, I, I think I I heard the question. It, it was very um, um, mummed, but but I think if if the question that that people are constantly exhorting each other to um, to perform the cam and. Um, absolutely. What I saw with Thinkam is that everybody is in some ways striving to do it, but in fact, it's it's oftentimes weaponized to, to use against people. So you don't say to people, oh, you didn't sacrifice so much enough, or I sacrificed so much for you. Why aren't you doing this for me? But the way that they use Thinkam, even though it's supposed to have a positive connotation, is always, well, this person isn't living up to this standard, you you don't show think am. Um, and that's a lot of what I show also in chapter five is the ways that people gossip about one another and how it's oftentimes women gossiping about each other while kind of letting men off the hook um, in, in expressing how men are so virtuous for helping or doing this and that, worshiping, um, being convivial, and a lot of times criticizing each other um, for not doing enough. Um, and so really these, these principles, you know, they're idealized and it's very easy to use a structuralist argument and say, well, this contains life. But in fact, that, that's really ethnographically um, dishonest to say that, that these, these principles guide every single behavior. Um, people are oftentimes in conflict with one another. And part of it also has to do with this kind of, it's not like it's a straight hierarchy where one um, dimension encompasses the other. They, they intersect and, and they rub up against each other. And, and this is where Thinkam works as a way of disciplining people, um, not just as a way of, of acting well or being good and virtuous. Um, did, that, did I answer that? I do. I apologize for that. Thank, thank you, Marav, and thanks, Oscar, for the question. And we have a question from David Lindsay. Mute. Unmute. Yes, thank you for this. This was, um, I've never seen anything quite like that. And it was, it was fascinating. And uh, it was surprising how it kept getting deeper and deeper. I was quite impressed. I want to go back to something in the beginning of your, your presentation, you talked about asymmetrical reciprocity, which is something I think I know about, but then you said it's respect above and yield below. And I want you to explain what yield below means. Yeah, um, so, so essentially this, this notion of respect above yield to those below means that if you have the means, if you're a senior, your job isn't just to, to get all the benefits, to get the respect, right? It's, it's also to give, to, to yield to those below you, to, um, to take care of them really. And that's kind of the, um, so, so in some ways, you know, for the China scholars, it's, it's a bit like the Guangxi. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, but it's really about that, that you're benefic beneficent and kind of paternalistic to those who have less than you, to those who are junior to you. And, and this is where um, the, 
the, we do have reciprocity in the sense that each side does things for each other, but this is on a much longer temporal scale. And so if parents and grandparents are taking care of kids, for example, they're yielding to them. We see it even with a greeting routine where the mother corrects the little baby's posture. Um, she does it in some ways that physically she pulls her up and it's a little bit um, harsh, but then the, the words and the gestures are also gentle. And this is how people, I think, get socialized into this idea that you don't give begrudgingly, you give willingly. Um, and when you don't, people criticize you for not really sacrificing or not really an acting think am. Um, and so when families put in so much effort for the ancestors, it's ostensibly not to make the ancestors angry. And it's also to show each other that they care and that, that they're putting up these resources and they're feeding one another, they're feeding those who need also in, in times of want. But there is also the expectation that, that the ancestors give to them, right? That they, that they don't punish them and moreover that they give them fortune. That, that you're able to succeed in life. And, and so in some ways, that, that's what I mean by yielding below, that it's not just the upwards directed, but that it's bi-directional, but not equal. Thank you very much. It's, it's so interesting how these very Vietnamese um, effects are in some ways universal. Thank yeah. you, David. And Marav, there's a question from Hoi Tam Ho Tai um, in, in the chat. Um, sure. Uh, Go yeah. Tam, would you like to ask your question or did you want us just to read it from the chat? Um, no, I can ask. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had encounters with uh, Vietnamese uh, women throughout actually central Vietnam I was uh, escorting American teachers and every single guide talked about how difficult it was to uh, deal with their obligations as daughters-in-law. They were living with the parents-in-law and they were expected to care for the mothers-in-law and sisters-in-law and felt that it was a real burden, both physically and emotionally. So I'm not, I'm just wondering um, about the gender of your informants. Um, were there mostly women? Did you talk a lot to the men in their families? And was there a difference in the way they approach obligations towards parents? Or did the men expect that their wives would take care of their own parents? And, you know, in the United States, uh, most caregivers are female. Um, maybe two thirds, three quarters of caregivers are, um, including uh, people who have experience dealing with um, things like physical therapy. You no, know, I've had experience with, you know, uh, visiting nurses, so I know. Um, and finally, in a lot of my experiences, women are the ones who make decisions as to money, uh, how much they can spend, how much they can, um, you know, uh, lend out, and so on. So I was wondering. Again, you know, uh, when it comes to this as asymmetric relationship, you know, um, do women bear most of the burden, and why? Is that something that um, that is culturally dictated, or you know, specific to the uh, families that uh, you interviewed? I want to say that, yes, as a woman, I probably interacted more with women than men, but I didn't exclusively interact with 
women, also with men. Um, and what I found is that um, that saying about women being the noitung um, is true. Oftentimes women also earned more than their husbands. Um, and that could create some conflict. Although oftentimes um, I found that men kind of took it anyway. Um, and women do um, provide a lot of the caregiving and do a disproportionate burden of the cooking, the cleaning, the tending to kids. Um, I am a bit reluctant to make universalist claims. I think um, Sherry Ortner does a very good job of explaining this culturally, um, you know, back in the seventies as, as female to male, as male as uh, nature is to culture. But I think that we can also find critiques um, of those, but um, I found that surprisingly some of the some of the women actually embraced um, being a good daughter-in-law. Um, in chapter five, I actually have a case that's a little bit different where um, the wife uses her earning power to distance herself from the in-laws. And of course she gets criticized for it, um, but she also appreciates the ways that her husband is extremely filial. And so we end up having the husband's sisters and the wife praising him for being so virtuous while they're doing a lot of the work of care and conviviality. Um, so, and, and then I also had some families rare, but it happened sometimes where the husband actually lived with the parents-in-law. And so, yes, women take on more. And I think part of it is that association with um, being that of sacrifice being um, the virtue of women that from the very beginning, Heeson is connected also with birth, with giving birth. Um, and so it's a kind of dual edged discourse where um, the expectation that you be moral, that you, that you give willingly, that you take care, that you be virtuous um, is obviously also disciplining and can be experienced as hurtful and violent. Um, and so in, in that sense, um, I, I think that, you know, obviously you have so much experience and, and I wouldn't discount it at all. It's, it's very much the case that uh, women, and I would say, especially it's, it's the poor women um, who, who end up shouldering a lot of this burden. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Yuhung. Um, Yuhung, uh, please go ahead. Hi, I'm so sorry that my internet is unstable, uh, unstable so I can't turn on my, my uh, camera. Um, so um, thank you for your talk. It's really interesting. And I'm so glad to see another research on the central region of Vietnam. Uh, so I, I'm just curious, though, because when we talk about uh, Guangnam people, um, right? So people have, uh, Vietnamese people have the saying, uh, Quang Nam Hai Gai, uh, which is the, the, the people from Vietnam like to talk back. Um, and I'm just um, curious if your research look at that kind of um, specific characteristics of, of the Quang Nam people and whether those uh, would affect any of the, you know, of, the, of their conception of He Sing and the Gam and, um, and if that, uh, change over time, uh, or if you see, if you observe uh, similar things uh, in 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 Quang Nam, in Da Nang, and in in other locations, if you if you conduct uh, research in other, uh, if you if you pay attention to, to that in in other locations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean the majority of research was was in Da Nang and Wang Nam, and um, and you know so I had much less observations in Hanoi, uh, some a bit in Hue and and Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, do people talk back? Of course they do sometimes, right? I mean we're all humans. Um, but I would say that, again, I, I presented a framework of how to behave that people strive to or criticize each other for not living up to it sometimes. Um, 
but for the most part, there there is that kind of effort to to hisen and the gam, even as people yeah, they talk back. Yeah, they joke about each other. Yeah, they tease. Sometimes they they hurt. Um, and and so all of it, you know, I don't want to present a picture perfect kind of um, idea of this uh, stability that, that people are um, solid into their roles, um, but rather it's it's that dynamism in how they interact with one another. Um, that makes it interesting. And that's why I find that attention to language um, and particularly the kind of the microdynamics of interaction that helps us see the extent to which they do or don't violate certain cul cultural norms. Does that make sense? Or did I completely misunderstand your question? Um, yeah, actually, I was thinking more of the, the, um, like the regional um, differences. Right. I, yeah. I think I think that that's a great question. Um, and I, I feel like having spent the majority of my time in central Vietnam, I don't I, I don't think I am the one best qualified to talk about the North. I'd say in the North is actually one of the places where I heard women more explicitly complain about these expectations that they end up taking on um, the, the role of virtuous wives at the same time that they have to do everything else. Um, but again, I think we have many people in the audience that have done much more research in the North that can tell us more about that. And I would need to go back and spend significantly more time in other regions to, to make a claim about that. Thanks, Marab. Uh, next question from Kuiha and Nguyen. Uh, thank you, Myra, uh, for your fascinating um, presentation on the topic. I'm very interested in the, um, actually my research on Vietnamese revolutionary cinema focused on the ideas of, um, of womanhood and motherhood, which is uh, somehow um, share or overlap um, in the sense of care, satisfy, uh, sacrifice uh, which your research, your fascinating research um, present. I have a two very brief question. The first one is about the idea of silence. Um, you talk about silence in the sense of social and com community uh, presence. Um, and um, this link to the, idea, uh, the, the, the point that the Hương have just presented, uh, uh, posed. It is about uh, the local locality. Um, so for that, I would like to ask you about the, uh, could you or did you consider the uh, historical dimension of the ideas of silence? Because Quảng Nam Lai Đà Nẵng or central of Vietnam, I'm from Quảng Bình. And then my whole family and then the neighbor, on the one hand, they share openly, but on as many, many points, they just keep that for them. They just don't want to, uh, to exposure the pain that they don't know if it is if it works for for the for a young like you know uh, generation like me to share that at which point they gonna open it but at some point so I would like to ask about the silence which is linked to the ideas of historical dimension and that particularly linked to the local uh, locality that you 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 you, you use uh, Quảng Nam and Da Nang as the place. Uh, to, to do your research. The second question is, it is about the ideas of Tinh Cam. And, um, and um, uh, I see that you talk and then your research focus on the ideas of material relation. And um, which is very, uh, this is really amazing, especially you show the clip where the daughter-in-law and the whole family have that kind of inter interaction. I have another question, uh, an, a, a question that um, that that keep uh, come coming up to me during the time uh, during when I was listening to your presentation is nowadays many people like Vietnam they 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 migrate to Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, or even abroad to earn uh, you know for living, and that kind of care, material care 
on the one hand, it's still as it as you uh, show, but on the other hand, they show other form of care, like they send um, remittance or they do FaceTime chat every time, like for an hour or do it similar like that. And then would you, um, uh, you know, talk about that if you, if your research uh, actually touch on that point, like other form of care rather than the material care that, you know, you presented um, wonderful already. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so with the cam, absolutely. It's it's not, I mean, of course, a lot of it, the most obvious is, is the cooking, the cleaning, the tending, but it is also, like you said, the going away and earning money and sending it back. And um, there is so much when I talk to Vietnamese people, my experience has been from everywhere, but I might be wrong, is oftentimes talking about their mothers and their parents. Um, he said, um, the ways that these relationships um, of care continue and span distances and, and span generations. And the same with silence. I mean, of course, there is the sonic silence of staying quiet, but there is also that silence surrounding painful events. Um, and one of the things that struck me is, for example, when somebody died, once they were buried, you were supposed to, to hold your feelings in and, and not talk about it. And I think a similar attitude about kind of that painful past, the historical suffering of war was not something that people generally opened up about. Um, I, I have come to wonder, um, when these these things um, happen, like at what point generationally, and I guess I think of it because um, my 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 grandmother was a Holocaust survivor, and she never ever ever spoke about it to us, to the family. And my mom, you know, did not think of her mom much like a Holocaust survivor, except sometimes, yes, right? Um, but then, you know, my generation is asking about it and wanting to find out. And I wonder if in Vietnam also, it's that third generation and beyond that are asking the questions that are wanting to hear. And that maybe as people get older, those who did survive um, atrocities and hardship, that maybe they become more ready to, to speak and to open up. And that one, I think it, it just requires more time. And so maybe when I was there, it wasn't so much spoken about, but that doesn't mean that there is going to be silence and perpetuity. And, and so definitely, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, and same, same with the GAM. I mean, it, it continues in different ways. It's just that the point is, is that it's not like love isn't just about feelings. It's also about doings. And you don't have to be right there to do, but that you show through actions, not just through words. So if you say, well, I love you, I love you, I love you. Well, yeah, that's good. But what can you do for me is, is the bigger question often. If that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Lonnie Jones. Um, Lonnie, did you want to ask it yourself or did you sure. want to read it from the chat? Sure, I can ask. I'm just thinking about um, the purpose of uh, sacrifice and care more generally, not specifically in this context, I guess. But um, And I got hung up when you said the word burden. And I'm just thinking about, um, you said there were some women who did sort of relish in this work is that did you see that very often and do you think that's like a lesser way of being is your um I guess your focus is kind of on this unequal dynamic that that you see yeah no that's a great question and and thank you for calling me on it because in fact it's it's almost unfair of me to say burden right because a lot of women actually yeah they said you know yeah my husband could clean could cook and all that but i want to do it i wouldn't be a, a proper woman if i didn't do it and so i think that 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 is kind of my imposition of of looking from the 
outside and saying, oh, that's a burden, right? But for, for many women, they do also internalize and cherish that work, not always, not all the time, right? Um, but, and, and that's where um, there is that kind of tension between a discourse that says, well, this is my job and this is what I want to do and I'm doing it willingly because I love and because I care. Um, and then sometimes it rubs up against, but I could also be doing other things. So, so I think it's, it's absolutely right of you to, to question that. Yeah, I'm just thinking about what is the alternative thing to do? I mean, I guess the unequal part of it is, I guess, distressing, but like, what else is more important than to care for I, I mean, but, th but that's a thing, right? That there is a kind of sense that in an ideal case, it works out well, that um, you give some and you get some and you're not giving the same. And this is why these acts of care are not fungible, right? It's not that I wash your dishes and you wash my dishes and we're even. The idea is that the there right. is more of that temporal horizon that we are constantly in a relationship right. and some creates a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, through Thank that you. inequality. Really beautiful work. <laughs> Thank you for the great question and the, the answer. Um, our, our final question will be from Tui. Um, and then what I'll do after we've answered this question, I'll stop the recording and then we'll keep it open for informal chit chat for those who would like to stay another 15 minutes after that. So go ahead, Tui. Okay, thank you. It's an interesting, uh, very interesting book. I can see like my whole family and my other family, Vietnamese family in your book, <laughs> like the condition, how people care. Um, uh, in, I have some, some questions. <laughs> Uh, the first is just in somewhere in your in your presentation you talk about uh, the state discourses. I'm not sure what what you mean by state discourses in gender equality or uh, or which uh, it you have time to talk more about that in when we have informal chat. But another question is about behavior and attitudes of the women, like whether like because I see in the video and the pictures, so most of the women are like somehow household women, like staying at home or doing some not professional jobs. So whether education and jobs and the like and economic condition of the family change the behavior and attitudes of the women or the people in terms of care and sacrificing. Because I see it's, in my family and other family that I saw in Vietnam, and my friend or some person, when they have a higher education, they, their attitude is different. So it's, it's, it's not, <laughs> and another one is about um, Western eyes. Like, do you, like, do you think your Western eyes, you see, it's, I, I consider you are Western eyes. You look at this as a, as the outsider, because when I see all of that, I, I explain it in different way, in in, in another ways, uh, because uh, uh, like you Hung and my other other talk about the the regional differences. I have two brother in law who are from the center of Vietnam. So uh, and Ko Hệ Tam also talk about the the the, the daughter in law take care taking care of the mother in law because the 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 culture of the, the in the center. Like on the property of the family, you return, you give to the son, so they expect the the mother, the daughter in law to take care. While other family, they they they, they even to share with others. So usually, sometimes the, the daughter, not the daughter in law, take care of their parents when they sick. So so like so when we look at that, we we think about culture and we see it's very normal. And we think about oh, property, maybe it's just, I give the, my property to you and you have to take care of me. Um, it's your responsibility, something like that, because we, we live in that condition. But under your Western eye, it's not wrong. It's not correct when, when you just look at how the daughter, the women taking care of their parents, and that's supposed to be like taking it by, doing by nurses or it's, it's just 
through your explanation, I'm not sure I got it, but through your explanation, is something not right, not right in in Western culture or in Western context or like somehow. So do you think that like your Western life affect your 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 explanations? That's it. I am sure that my Western eyes affect my explanations. Um, I don't think I was trying to criticize the system of relations, um, quite the opposite. I was saying that this is the way it works and a lot of times it works quite well. And I think what, what it does help us understand though is also why does social reproduction continue? Um, and a lot of times it continues not through oppression, it continues because people participate in a system, right? We collude in a system and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, um, it is the way that things are. Um, whether we want to come in and criticize, that's a different point. Um, but I'm not sure that we must. Um, the, what I found is that I think because this was a generation pre the family planning, and so the people who were adult and in a position to care, they oftentimes had multiple siblings. And so um, it was care was distributed among daughters and daughters-in-law. It wasn't just daughters-in-law. It wasn't just daughters. It wasn't just hired help. Um, the women, I think if you saw in some of the pictures, these are not necessarily uneducated women. Um, what I am saying is that a lot of times for the worship rituals um, and even, you know, needing to care of the mother-in-law who has fallen sick, um, they had to suspend their work. They had to take time off um, and come and take care. And, and so that's where there is a kind of burden. I also found that men, oftentimes it didn't really matter if they're drinking with their brothers-in-law or if they're drinking with their brothers, they enjoyed it, right? Um, and it was oftentimes sisters and sisters-in-law who would do the job of cleaning up behind them, right? And of putting together the system of relations. But I don't think that it's, that it's necessarily bad. It's just different. No. Um, and and um, the one, I, I did um, see one case of a family that was particularly well off. And in that case, the mom actually, she, she goes to an ancestor worship ritual and, and I talk about it in chapter two. Um, so she does kind of the duty, but nominally, and then she has to run off to work because she, she has like an important position. And here it is, her sisters, her hired help, um, the sisters-in-law who do the work of, of putting on the event and her husband comes and, and worships um, in her stead. So there is always at least somebody from the family. Um, but I wouldn't say it's just women doing all the work. And I wouldn't say that it's necessarily bad that women do end up doing a disproportionate um, amount of that kind of work. Men also are saddled with a lot of duties and burdens and, and so forth. Um, but I'm sure that if I wasn't Vietnamese, I mean, if I was Vietnamese, I would see so much more, I would hear so much more, I would understand. I mean, obviously, I'm, a, I'm not a native speaker. And so I'm sure I missed a lot. Um, and I'm sure that if I had grown up in Vietnam, I would be, I, there is a good chance I'd be seeing things differently than, than I did. Thank, thank you, you Marav, and thank you everyone for your wonderful questions and um, for joining us for the talk today. Um, I'm gonna bring it to a close now, but uh, I'm gonna stop the record here, but please join me in thanking Marav for our wonderful talk and discussion.